wonderful. I think we have a few more people, I think, who hopefully would join in. So good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are joining us today. Uh, this is the third edition of what we call is our fireside chat, where we invite interesting speakers from around the world to join us and hopefully pick up some learnings on a topic that is of interest to all of you. Uh, and today we have something very, very interesting lined up. And uh, I'm very, very pleased to welcome our, our speaker for today, which is Anand, Anand Damni, who's already on video. And I'll do a quick introduction before handing it over to him. Uh, Anand has been a behavioral scientist for more than a decade. And I think, interestingly, he's one person who has made a career shift from the world of advertising uh, to actually doing behavioral science full time. And in the course of his work, He's read thousands of research papers and white papers in the field. Uh, also very well known in the industry today and has been featured in prominent business magazines, including The Time, uh, BBC, Forbes, etc. Uh, as was also has worked with a wide array of blue chip organizations, including uh, Mercedes, Benz, Viacom, Deloitte, and so on during the course of his decade plus, decade plus experience in the field of uh, behavioral science. He's also a, a sort of a keynote speaker who speaks at the multiple conferences on the fields of leadership, using behavioral science in areas like investments to uh, sales and marketing to uh, even culture change, um, and is also speaking at the SoCal at the TEDx platform. So welcome formally on board, uh, Anand, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Rakesh, Shubham, and everyone who's joining today. Thank you, Anand. And is there something that you'd like to share uh, about yourself that I might have possibly missed in the short introduction? before we get started uh no we'll i think we'll cover we'll cover as your questions go along uh there's Sounds good there's actually so much about behavioral science that we can't even touch upon two percent one percent of it today <laughs> but we'll nice. try to do as much as much as we can absolutely thank you so much for that so i'd like to get this kicked off with uh, a, a change that i found very very interesting which is the change that you moved a pivot rather from the world of advertising to the world of behavior science. So could you talk to us a little bit about that in the first place and then we'll get started. So I uh, started my career in advertising. I did uh, uh, a few years in sales and marketing and then came back to advertising. Mostly spent my time at Linta Slow, as they call it, the ad agency. Um, uh, and when I was in advertising, uh, you know, our marketers, our clients would obviously give us briefs that are about, uh, you know, we want the consumers to do X, Y, Z. Of course, we want them to buy, but then we want to change this habit. We want to change this behavior. And we would always, you know, since we had the only tool advertising, we would use advertising to do that, right? And in 2012, I chanced upon this field called behavioral economics, uh, where there are these academicians, mostly from the US and UK, and they were... I chanced upon their work that they were doing phenomenal research and actually, you know, how to change behavior. And I figured that all this while in advertising, while we were thinking we were changing consumers' behavior, we were actually impacting consumers' awareness, consumers' perception and mindsets. And then hoping that that changes into action, hoping that that awareness, that brand imagery, that perception would actually lead to sales. Uh, but when I chanced upon behavioral economics, I chanced upon this field, which is completely different way of changing behavior and uh, for real changing behavior, you know, from intent to action. Uh, and that there is a, always a gap between intent and action. Like, for example, I mean, we want to exercise and be fit, but how many of us end up doing it, right? Intent is there. We want to do the marathon. We want to go for a jog. Uh, intent is there, but getting that into action is is not easy, right? Uh, same thing. So I found that there's a huge gap between intention and action. And there's this whole field called behavioral, behavioral economics. Um, actually, I chanced upon this this uh, Nobel Prize winner, Richard Thaler, who, of course, won a Nobel Prize after 50 years of his work in behavioral economics and uh, studying how we take decisions. And when I chanced upon his book, Nudge, uh, which is quite a popular book, I was blown. I was like, I have to leave my job and do something on my own. And do something in behavior change, you know. And that time, behavioral economics was a term everyone was calling it. Today, everyone calls it behavioral science, which is a combination of psychology, cognitive neuroscience, behavioral economics, uh, psych uh, social psychology, cognitive psychology. Uh, but that time, they would call it behavioral economics. So I was like, you know, this is very academic, but it has major implications for uh, organizations, governments, 
us as individuals in our own uh, personal lives to change our habits uh, and that's when i chanced that's when i said i have to take that move and i have to uh, get deep into it and you know one once i started with reading one book of richard thaler then i went back to the bibliography started seeing the papers i got so deep into it that i started reading the scientific papers and in the beginning they were like so difficult because like 36 37 pages and i i wasn't a reader at all i wouldn't even read books uh, this is prior to 2012 but once i started reading i just couldn't stop and it's been like a decade um, now one paper led to the other led to the other uh, now it's been more than 15000 real science experiment oh. that i have read and these are and these are real experiments on real people with their real decision making uh, you know uh, habits and and understanding on how we make choices uh it's not some pseudo science it's real i figured that even you know when i started off i thought maybe you know this is new it's pseudo uh, you know how psychology perception is but then as i got deep into it i understood that behavioral science is really about studying how you make choices just the way uh, medicines are you know trialed and there's randomized controlled trials uh, to figure what medicine works there are randomized controlled trials for the last 50 years being done on us on people <laughs> and our decision making abilities uh, whether it's to do with how we buy jam whether it's to do with how we uh, uh, how we choose a spouse or partner how we study how we grow how we invest so it's it's that that really led me to <laughs> i can imagine uh, getting into very journey it is it is quite a journey and um, for a person who never would read and write so i wouldn't read and write before 2012 uh but once i started reading then i started writing uh and then you know that became a loop uh, reading and writing yeah. became a loop because if i had to write i had to read because uh, i never had the knowledge of behavioral science i'm self taught uh so how would i write without really uh reading and then slowly reading writing became a habit loop and then you know you get into the mastery of of it uh, it of course takes time it's taking a lot of time <laughs> and i think mastery in anything requires time right i think whether it's whether yeah, it is yeah. 10000 hours that people say or even x number of hours but i think mastery it's mastery. much more trust That's me right. that 10000 numbers got that. fixated uh, but <laughs> but it's much more in reality much more i can imagine and while we wait i think a few more people have joined in so thank you for joining us today on our five side chat with anand um and just to share i think do engage with us over chat i think today you may not be able to speak up uh, as per the settings of the session but feel free to uh, put in your responses either using the icons emojis or uh, on the chat and do post any questions that you have we have a few winners uh, and goodies for winners arranged at the end uh, do feel free to share on social media at the end of it any possible lessons that you may pick up if nothing else we can guarantee you that it'll give you at least enough material for a really interesting social media post you can use either tag us the company handle or uh, you could use hash focus your file starter my side chat um on social media when you do that and uh, coming back to our conversation and when we talked about uh, reading up a lot about 15000 papers and i remember our first chat um i was shocked by the number that there are so many papers available on something right and i heard you briefly mention that it is a science at the end of the day so one segue into a conversation would be to figure out how does it how does it really work as a science you know could you tell us a bit more for people for those among us who are not really familiar with the topic what exactly does behavioral science mean you know compared to what it used to be right so i'll i'll give you example so uh, sure. first i i want to actually introduce a little bit of what behavioral science is so that there's a little common sure. understanding between all of us so behavioral science is like i said is a study of how we make choices and decisions right and then how those can be influenced so for example in behavioral science a lot of the work points to the direction that to change the person we can change the environment and then the desired action can happen okay so just for example like i um i still sometimes have a bad habit of overeating right okay when the food is uh, delicious i cannot stop right so what i did couple of years back is i uh, i chanced upon this this idea of course it's not my original idea but i chanced upon it and the idea was that when you are eating some crockery right if you have a 12 inch plate right try and reduce it to 9 inch right if you have a spoon which is slightly big try and reduce it to medium yeah automatically you will eat less right so the change in the environment 
led to change in my behavior, not consciously, but subconsciously, because I changed the environment, right? Now, this is from a study, right? Uh, one of the lakhs and millions of studies being done in behavioral science, which is actually done on people. So say half the group, right? Uh, say a group of people are called for dinner or something, you know, they are of course not told that what the experiment is all, all about. They probably told something else, right? And the actual experiment is where half the people are given nine inch crockery size plates, right? With slightly smaller spoons. And the other half is given 12 inch crockery size plates with a slightly bigger spoon. And then, you know, and these are people who are randomly put in group one and group two. Right, it's also called randomized randomized control trial or A B testing. Right, so there's a control which in this case will be a 12 inch crockery plate, and you want to try a nine inch, you want to try eight inch, you want to try a 10 inch. Right, and then they had a weighing machine as well, uh, right, through which they were able to weigh how much food was taken by people who were eating in a nine inch crockery plate versus how much food was consumed and taken by people who were using a 12 inch crockery plate and they found the difference that when people were using a 9 inch they automatically ate less even if they served themselves twice which is most of us might go for a second serving yet uh, taking that also into account it was it, it was shown that uh, the study showed that you know people who were consuming in the 9 inch crockery plate end up ended up eating lesser and that really is behavioral science because you can prove cause and effect Right. So what tends to happen is many times, you know, people, I mean, we all get confused between correlation and causation. Just because it's summer, right, and you're advertising your ice cream and your ice cream is selling doesn't mean it's the advertising that's calling, causing the sales. It just could be summer. So to, to, to um, establish the relationship between cause and effect, right, these scientific experiments are done in behavioral science via randomized control trials, very similar to how drugs and vaccines and all of those are tested. So at right. one level, yes, there is science because, uh, it, you know, you are able to test your interventions on people and understand the decision-making, uh, you know, results. On the other hand, human beings are super complicated, right? <laughs> we are very, very complicated. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if you had to replicate the same experiment, you had, you'd have to control the absolute, the same settings. You know, the context has to be very, very similar in order for you to replicate it. And sometimes you're not going to be able to replicate. Context changes, right? If you're driving in a car and listening to something, is very different than when you're listening to something at home. Once the context changes, then your behavior changes, right? Which is all, which is what behavioral science, you can change behavior by changing the environment, right? And therefore it is complex, right? At the same time, it is scientific because we can use scientific tools and measurements to uh, try, test, influence, measure behavior. Uh, yeah. At the same time, we are, we are human beings ultimately. <laughs> the most complex yeah. creatures, right? So, yeah. And I think you hit, hit the nail on the head when you say that uh, I think a lot of times correlation doesn't mean causality. And I think it's a, it's a challenge that we see even today all across social media, right? I think you'll find a lot of people who will probably write something which sounds true, right? Which is like uh, getting up early, for example, guarantees immense wealth. Now, uh, when I think about it, and I think, okay, who are the people who really get up early, other than, of course, the billionaires who are cited? Um, newspaper delivery folks get up early. Milk delivery folks get up early. Does it guarantee yeah, that it's not really, right? So I think it is a fair point to consider that correlation and causality need to be considered. I'm glad to hear that that is the fundamentals on which behavioral science also exists. Yeah. So when you work uh, in that field, um, typically, how do you ensure that uh, what we are talking about um, in terms of a experiment, in terms of a randomized trial, also translates on a large scale to human behavior, right? In terms of, does it really work? You know, are, are there studies on that as well? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, see, the studies, of course, that are usually conducted by academicians, they are not on very, very large scales because there's okay. limited funding. There are so many okay. behavioral scientists. There are so many things to experiment about, right? Okay. However, in my work, uh, you know, the kind of work that I do where I use apply behavioral science to get uh, marketers and consumers to try, buy and upgrade, right? In those cases, the scale is very large. So, for example, if I'm working with India's number one private bank, right? Uh, and they have a huge uh, customer base, more than a crore, right? Out of which, say, for example, just for example, say 50% are not on DND, 
they can be contacted via communication. So then what we do is among say a group of 50 lakhs, we choose 10 lakh customers to try our solutions on, whether they're communication, whether they are UI, UX, right? You can take, you, we can develop like say nine uh, alternative solutions, right? To get the consumer to take X decision. So for example, say uh, the project is to get the bank's own customers to adopt credit cards. A small percentage, uh, you know, is adopted already credit cards, a larger percentage, of course, using debit cards, right? That's the situation in India. Now, if the bank wants uh, uh, to increase the credit card adoption amongst the existing customers, what we can do is we can, amongst the existing customers, randomly choose a group of one lakh, one lakh, one lakh customers, right? And our intended communication based on behavioral science then goes to different one lakh customers, whereas the control goes to another set of one lakh customers. As, as a solution, whether it's a form of SMS or an email. And that at, when, when that communication is sent, right, that is really A-B testing being done live. So on a Friday morning, 10 lakh customers are being sent 10 kinds of messages. Nine are based on behavioral science. One is the control which the client is already sending, right? And then we can see who's clicked on what link, what are the conversion rates, what are the click rates, open rate, conversion rates, right? So scale is very much part of behavioral science and i believe if, if behavioral science cannot be scalable then it's not it's not a good solution if it can't be easy to implement it's not practical then it's not even a solution in my head and i think uh, the project that you spoke about sounds very interesting where you work with say a large bank and i think that's also the power of india that you have such scale at which to actually roll out some of these studies could you talk to us a little more about uh, some of the work you've done specifically to impact behavior change yeah, so there, there are lots of projects I've done in the area of uh, marketing conversions, right? Which is getting people sure. to take the desired action in the last mile. So there is right. there is some uh, awareness building work, which is brand building, mm -hmm. imagery building, perception. That is not what behavioral science is about. And behavioral science gets applied in the last mile of decision making. So say I am a bank's new, uh, new customer. I'm being onboarded, right? And the bank wants to increase my... Uh, average balance. The bank wants me to transact more with that bank rather than the old bank that I'm with, right? So therefore, then I then we use behavioral science techniques in their communication, whether it's messaging, emailing, uh, or their UI UX, and creates nudges, uh, right? Uh, embed behavioral science principles, uh, which I can talk to you about some of them, uh, which are so powerful. Then that makes the communication or the intervention so persuasive that it results in a desired action, whether the desired action is subscribe, apply, renew, uh, you know, try, upgrade, whatever that may be. So, so I've used a lot of behavioral science for, for a lot of service industry clients, which are banking, insurance companies, telecom companies, uh, non-banking finance companies. These are, these are the kind of projects where, where I've done increasing credit card conversions, uh, any kind of product, getting insurance, customers to renew their policies, getting telecom customers to upgrade from a particular prepaid pack, lower value prepaid pack to a higher value prepaid pack, right? These are these are things that marketers uh, always looking, right? They're looking at, they have three objectives, maybe, right? Either they want to get new customers to try their products or they want to get the existing customers to try new products. And I say that's try, that comes in the try. They want the existing customers to rebuy or renew their plan, right? or they want to get their existing customers to upgrade. So I apply behavioral science in all three marketing, uh, for all three marketing challenges. Wonderful. Uh, it takes me to many, many moons ago when I think I was a, a very young summer intern, uh, two decades or so back. And I think that was with uh, PepsiCo and we were experimenting with these uh, different sizes of beverages which you get in these movie counters, right? And today I think uh, right. They have taken that science to a different level. I think great to hear about that being applied across industries. And thank you yeah. so much for sharing that, Anand. Um, sure. If I move slightly away from, say, the world of marketing and talk about, say, the world of uh, people, right, which is where a lot of our uh, guests today are from, which is from the world of HR and learning. Uh, are there applications for behavioral science and things like, say, helping an organization to work in organizational culture building, you know, like values and so on and so forth. Have you seen applications of your science? Yeah, there, there is immense, there is immense, immense opportunity in applying behavioral science at work. Uh, there are few companies that are leading that, right? I would, I would say Google is one of the leading companies which applies behavioral science at work. 
um there is one project i can talk about uh, which i am doing uh, right and then maybe we can touch upon other areas of organizational change so so one of the projects that uh, that i am doing is to get employees uh, especially sales staff of of india's number one consumer lender uh, to to start using their learning platform right now before before i tell you about the learning platform um i know that the audience here is uh, a lot of them are from learning and development right but uh, there is something uh, that you know i'm going to say that which may they may not they may not like right so when imagine i am so when i look at even at my work wherever i look at behavior change i look at the user as the customer right so if i if i am doing something for marketers then the end consumer is the customer right and when i when i look at uh working with human resources or learning and development uh, especially for a project i look at the end customer which is the employee as a customer right i don't i don't i don't look at the cust- as the employee as someone who who will be doing what we tell them to do because they have their own mind they have their own agenda and as a an employee uh, my first agenda is 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 to you know build my career is to get experience is to get paid well is to learn uh, from my ongoing job have a good boss uh, you know that's my environment really and uh, and and a lot of learning i'm expecting to be doing on the job and a lot of learning i'm expecting to be doing um, you know why am i why am i boss why am i mentor why am i boss why am i colleagues peers uh, and that is really learning in my in my head as an employee as a user right uh whereas what is happening now we the challenge that we faced with this company is that the learning platform was not being used right so so uh when we are when we are going to our client when i'm going to the client you know i have to first tell the client that look learning extrinsic learning is way down in the priority <laughs> okay of the employees it's not way up there way up there is is money compensation culture career boss team right uh so learning from from a learning app uh, where i have to go through material that's that's way down in my motivation right so in behavioral science what happens there are two things you can play a lot with to change behavior one is the motivation yeah and the other is the ability to perform the behavior right i'll give you example and then i'll come back to learning and development app right so for example the first uh, behavior change uh, experiment i did was self funded self initiated where i installed a red button on the dashboard of the car yeah every time the driver honked this red button would beep and flash and the driver had to press the button but red button to switch off this annoying sound right and this basically in our in the experiment that i did reduced drivers honking by 61% right so what i'm going to come at is that the horn is so conveniently placed given everybody's motivation on our indian roads the motivation motivation to honk is very high right and the horn is very conveniently placed so motivation is high ability to perform the behavior is high boom honking happens yeah. right the behavior happens so here what we did is we reduced the motivation by creating a red button right so every time the driver would honk now the driver would deliberate whether i should honk or should not and in our experiment we found an average reduction of 61% over over 4000 kilometers which means 61% of honking was not required because everything mm-hmm. else remained the same right yeah. so we used the environment right to reduce the motivation we didn't tamper with the horn because that would be illegal but we introduced this seat belt like uh, reminder right and that mm-hmm. broke people's habit of honking so coming back to lnd app there are two things one is you either increase or decrease motivation i mean not decrease but increase motivation or you make right. the ability to uh, perform the learning much easier now mm-hmm. we all know that out of 100 people any given 100 people there will be fewer people whose intrinsic motivation will be very high right yeah. so it's very very difficult to increase motivation right most marketers most people most behavior change programs most people who want to change behavior will first look at motivation and try and increase motivation but that is very very difficult yeah because there is limited control you have over a, another individual what you can do and is what is in fully in your control is make the ability to perform easy 
So what do I mean? So what what was happening on this learning app of the client is that there were very very big large PowerPoint presentations with hundreds of slides. There were long videos. And there was very very big large you know reading material. So the learning itself was very difficult. Now you have a situation where motivation is low, right, for this activity, and then the platform is making it more difficult to learn. You're never going to manage people to learn. So instead, what we did is we said we will first we will work on increasing the ability to learn, right? So bite-sized videos, right? Very simple. What I'm going to say is very very simple, but these are some of the things in behavior science that works. Make it very easy and fun to learn. Firstly, so make 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 learning fun by having bite-sized videos, you know, where you don't have to read a lot of material, right? Uh, make the app so easy and pleasurable to use that it's literally like using one of the social media apps, right? Why are people on social media? One, because the app is very easy to use. Second, of course, because the content is so interesting, right? So make the learning app very very easy to use, and then also make the content very interesting, engaging, and bite-sized, right? So this is one thing we did. to make the learning app easy and fun second to increase motivation on the learning app we said that so the so the original learning app had this uh, you know gamification things like typical leaderboard and this company has 12000 employees so just imagine rakesh you and me will be will be 3342 we are still ahead of 9000 people but we are still 3342 so that's not going to increase our motivation right it's going to decrease our motivation so we remove that leaderboard right we said that we will create five levels of a learner right we will create a beginner we will create a advanced we will create a, a experienced we will create a, a pro and a master and you can go up the levels you know as a learner and you could be a very senior person you could be a junior person it doesn't matter on this platform you are equal you are a learner on this platform so you could be a very senior person on the platform you will be tagged the beginner if you've not done too many courses mm-hmm. or not consumed too much yeah. content you know and we said that just like on instagram of course instagram like you have your profile hidden and open but here we said we will keep all the employees profiles open so rakesh yeah. will be able to see anand is what level how many courses has he done what courses yeah. has he liked you know so there is social proof social proof mm-hmm. is a behavior science principle where we act the way how other people like us behave right so if you are mm. not sure of how to behave we look at other people so if you are going to a restaurant right we will see the reviews if you are buying something on amazon in on a book we'll see the reviews we'll see the ratings right that's a shorthand way of people taking a decision when they are not sure of how to decide right so for example i did another experiment where uh, and this was originally robert cialdini's experiment where uh, in a neighborhood right the the they were testing the 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 electricity power consumption of people and all those people who consumed less above the average in the neighborhood their their uh, bills were being stamped at the average is much lower you know mm-hmm. so what it made it made it made it very clear to what the neighbors around are doing neighbors around are consuming less and that got people to consume less so this is the power of of social proof is what third mentality simply put right uh, we do like other people do so in on the learning app app also we would you would be able to see that okay if we are peers what has anand which courses has he done what is he like you know uh, and and those elements are where we try to increase the motivation but the first go of the instinct of people to is to increase motivation and that is very difficult so the first instinct of behavioral science is to change the environment make things easy or make things difficult depending on what behavior if you if i wanted to reduce honking i made made the motivation low right i didn't tamper with the horn but uh, there will be circumstances where you want to make it a little difficult for you to uh, con- go, go on consuming a pack of chips right you keep it right top of the shelf hidden behind in the cabinet you're making it more difficult to to uh, you know uh, consume those chips if you don't want to but if you want to then you keep it eye level you keep it right in front of you uh, right and that yeah. that will help you increase uh, the chances of uh, changing your behavior so in environment change is largely the approach strategy of behavior science change the environment change the behavior wonderful and i think uh, i think you mentioned google being at the forefront of uh, this field as well and i remember something where 
um, even performance parameters like OKRs, objectives, and key results of all executives uh, yes. in Google and many other companies, and we have started implementing OKRs in our organization also a year back, um, has actually helped to drive better performance as well. And I think, thank you for bringing that point up that I think sometimes social proof is very, very essential for removing, let's say, even obstacles, right? I think you can make something literally easier to do. And I think most of the very, very viral um, easy to use products, like if you look at Google search or an Uber app or Instagram, I think all of them have that in common, that are you reducing the obstacles to a consumer being able to interact with your product? Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, one related thing, and I think a, a good takeaway for all of us, probably both from uh, learning and development departments and even from companies like Focusio, I think is that while we might be in love with our products and we believe that we're truly totally making a difference, I think an individual learner possibly doesn't wake up in the morning thinking, yeah, I'm going to go to office today and learn. Right? They want to go about <laughs> their daily lives. Absolutely. Right? But how do we remove that obstacle and kind of uh, get make their life easier is possibly how we could impact that. And interestingly, I'm going to pick up one of the trends that somebody posted. So when you try something at this scale, I'm guessing that you will probably need the buy-in of very senior folks at the organization. Even if it is a learning intervention, I'm guessing other top management folks also need to be involved and probably give you a nod of approval or their blessing. Yeah, so uh, so it depends. It depends organization to organization, right? The right. trick is not to involve the senior management. <laughs> <laughs> the right. trick is to the trick is to between of course the senior manager is going to be involved but the trick is to manage them and at the no. same time do more experiments on ground right mm -hmm. that's where the learning is let the let the project start with data end with data and and let i believe the autonomy should be with the junior and middle management a lot right on these mm -hmm. projects that's when this goes smoothly and then uh, we deliver results, we do experiment, we do pilot, deliver result, everyone is happy, uh, seniors will also be happy. Of course, you need and seniors buy-in, right? They need to buy into yeah. behavioral science. They are the one going to be sanctioning the budgets. Uh, uh, so, for, so for that, yes, you do need the involvement. But at the same time, you don't yeah. need too many cooks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think it uh, brings up an interesting point that especially when you work in, say, an established organization, maybe a public sector um, organization or even an institution with a very rich cultural heritage which perhaps is resistant to change bringing yeah. about change or managing change in those places also must be much more difficult than a say a traditional than a, probably a more newer organization very very and the reason i said that junior and middle management is they are more open see as mm -hmm. you grow older uh, you do become more rigid habits do set in far more firmly right so it yeah. is really the the people who are close to the reality who actually want to make a change far easier and they're less resistant than the upper management. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is no doubt, there is no project that I do without the involvement of senior management. Right? They have to buy into behavioral science, they have to sanction the project. Uh, but you know, the proof of the pudding is, is in the experiments, is in showing what works, what doesn't work. Right? Once we are mm -hmm. able to do that, then that success builds on itself. And then it right. leads to a momentum. You know, mm -hmm. once you show some results, uh, right, there is more trust in the team, there is more trust in me, there is more trust in themselves, the senior management whom has more trust in me and the client team being together delivering results. Yeah. So it's a it's a you know, in behavior change, we say tiny, tiny habits, tiny steps, you know, like Kaizen is a philosophy in uh, Japanese philosophy. Actually, it became very popular by, uh, by the Japanese, originally American philosophy, Kaizen. Um, it was being implemented during the back times, of course, during the World War to make improvements in their machinery by the U.S. Army. And then the Japanese uh, in the 60s, 70s, 80s just took it on like, uh, you know, they adopted Kaizen like as if it's their own, uh, right? And Kaizen is all about small, tiny improvements, you know. Uh, keep making small, tiny tweaks, small, tiny improvements in your process. Focus on the process, the results will come. That's really what I try to do with clients. Of course, the buy-in is there, needs to be there with senior management. But uh, I work a lot with mid, junior and middle, get things moving, prove the results, and then the seniors get happy. Wonderful. And thank you for sharing that, Anand. Uh, I think very valid point we bring about that, uh, especially in organizations, if you're able to show some traction using data, because I think in many places, especially learning and development folks also, um, the biggest question that they face is, does this really bring about change or do people actually learn? Yeah. 
um, yeah. what is the ROI of the money that we spend and so on and so forth, right? So yeah. in that context, have you done any work around, say, culture, things like values, etc.? So, so most 99% of my work has been for marketers because they've been early adopters right. of legal science and everything is data-driven. So it's very kind of, sort of not very, but more transparent than, uh, you know, than okay. learning and development. So for the app, for example, at least there are users how many users are logging in, how many users are active. So wherever okay. there is, uh, you know, one can measure data digitally, uh, one must attempt to do that, right? At the same time, I understand that everything cannot be measured, measured, uh, just for the sake of being measured, right? Uh, but there are lots of things that can be done that come to my mind since you've asked me this question. Um, you know, there are meetings that I've attended that have gone on and on, right? Uh, whereas that same meeting with a more constructive agenda and more focused approach could have been shorter. And that time, I think, what if that meeting was was held standing? It would get over soon, right? You change the environment, you change the behavior. So there are, there are I think, hundreds of things that can be done within an organization to change the culture. Because culture is really, so as, as people, we have habits, right? And, yeah. and organizations have routines, systems, routines, right? And those routines can be changed. And I feel there are there are broadly two ways in which organizational culture can be changed. Uh, one is your uh, is your physical environment, and physical includes digital because now a lot of it is digital as well. So physical and digital environment you can influence, and the other your environment becomes your systems and processes within the company, right? So if I am joining a particular company, uh, if I if it's easy to recognize what's going to get me promoted, then I'm going to do that behavior, right? Uh, no matter what you have on your walls and your vision and your mission, most of which I find quite useless, to be honest, in most of the companies, because most of them use words like maximize shareholder value, profit, uh, profit segment growth. They mean nothing, really. Uh, what really means to for the employee is what significance, what meaning are they doing? You know, what are they bringing you know, to the company? What difference are they making? Uh, so right. if the company doesn't have a very easy to understand digestible mission, uh, again, we come back to Google. So Google, I think till a lot of time has this, you know, we want to, uh, uh, you know, make information accessible, uh, right, uh, to the whole world. And that's, that's like a mission that's ongoing, it's never going to end. Right? And that's yeah. resulting in so many, so many unique, innovative products, because everything then boils down to making information usable, accessible. Uh, for people that it's products coming out from Gmail to driverless cars to whatever. And that's really because, because there is some meaning, significance, and there is a focus on what the employees should bring on to the table, you know. Um, so that's, those are some basic things that are missing in, I feel, in a lot of companies. Uh, and there's a huge scope in, in changing culture, right down from changing that, bringing clarity, right down to driving that into, that intention into action. So that clarity then should get linked with how people get promoted directly. There should be no disconnection between what the company wants to achieve and ongoing wants to keep achieving and be successful and direct link to what the employee should get promoted on, uh, whether the person is in operations, account, sales, whatever, uh, you know. So so those and are things uh, that, can be, that can be done, yeah. Yeah, and I think culture is something that is still... Uh, probably very misunderstood, like you said, you write a very fancy mission statement on a wall. Uh, it makes for a nice wallpaper, but it really doesn't inspire the person who walks into office the next day. Right? So, yeah, are we able so to translate that into action. Yeah. 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 Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I think that I think becomes the crux of where we are able to uh, build tiny habits, which essentially make a difference on the ground. And I think fully agree to uh, your point on that one because. Uh, our work on culture also tells us a very similar thing that uh, if an organization says that culture is important, then are they making decisions based on, say, cultural tenets, for example, right? Or in tough times, that is just a poster on the wall and you make decisions for uh, X, Y, Z, other metrics, right? So I think, yeah, very similar yeah. to what it is. Mentioned. I, since you were talking about this, I got one more point. I mean, I thought of one more behavior science experiment. You know, imagine if a company is always talking about growth, growth of employees, growth of employees. And at the same time, you see the practices of that company. Typically, if a company has uh, performance appraisals, right, which is 
uh, also time for increments and appraisals and and usually they happen like say once a year or whenever they happen right and in that conversation what typically happens is that uh, managers with their people with their team people have conversations about the past performance which is how did you do uh, and therefore what should be increment and what do i expect from you in the future and therefore how, you know how should be your growth now at that point in time behavioral science experiments have found that if you are talking about earning and learning in the same conversation the learning part of the brain of the employee shuts down because the employee is at time focused only on earning because at the at the end of the day he or she or they want to know about uh, what is my increment you know so i have done x y z okay we agreed to the past performance what is my increment and whatever be the intention whether genuine not genuine the employee as a user as a customer at that time takes in all the information of learning development and growth for himself or herself as being a way that you know it's being rationalized as if because i've got only 8% increment you are rationalizing that i have so much to grow no every individual has so much to grow but if that conversation is held separately completely cut off from each other one is your conversation about your past performance and your increment over right couple of months later completely looking at the employee's learning needs and development because that's what you want the employee how the employee to grow and come to a agreement with the employee that this is expected of you what do you think what do what do we think let's come to agreement and that's a separate conversation when that is done the learning drastically improves so yeah, very, you very had so what i was trying to do is i was trying to link the values of the company if some company has growth and mm-hmm. how it translate into real life of the employee Uh, that connection has to be seamless and that is really walking the talk and that's really behavioral yeah. science because ultimately you want to change behavior you just want to talk about it you want to change you want you want to see that difference happening on a day to day week to week you know basis when you're interacting with your team members that it's interesting that you point this out that even today i think in a large chunk of organizations sorry rakesh here is... i'm unable to Am hear I... you uh, is that better Sorry, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you, Anand. Yeah, I I can uh, hear you now. Sorry, I think my AirPods went off. No worries. So, in terms of uh, specifically the process, I was I was thinking that a large number of companies even today, I think, link these two conversations together, which is a salary yeah. increment and a performance appraisal, right? And interestingly, I think we hear, especially among our clientele who are uh, probably the cutting edge in terms of best practices in. Uh, probably compensation and benefits and performance management moving away from what is a traditional annual appraisal cycle to having more periodic check-ins you know which rightly focus on the development of the individual and keeping the salary increment conversation at a, at a later stage and i think uh, glad to hear that i think uh, that is rooted in behavioral science um, yes. as well because i think otherwise we are we're just doing the same process and existing expecting different results every time we do it sure yeah and i think uh, in terms of how people uh, work on these challenges are there specific areas that they could start off say for example if an organization is let's say not use behavioral science at all right yes in, in any of these fields you know like learning or yes. marketing or any of those fields what would be yes. a good place to get started let's say in let's say learning and development since that is one of the areas so so i would say it depends on what is the is the challenge or the biggest priority of that uh, team or that company you know uh, whatever is the biggest priority uh, i think that should be taken on and uh, the mindset should be to try and experiment and see what works you know mm-hmm. uh, because what happens many a times people are always you know there's analysis paralysis oh I, I you know we have this problem we know but there are months and years pass where people are discussing and debating and nothing happens the po- yeah. the, the point is to is to start pilots you yeah. know now what happened in the pandemic before the pandemic i mean i remember writing work from home uh, I, and so i i would write i write, write a lot of editorials also in papers i wrote one on work from home in 2014 <laughs> and that time it was like a shocker and what was the attitude of everybody before pandemic for work from home 
it was that no i mean how do we trust trust employees they will be slacking they'll be sleeping off on in their beds they'll be watching netflix they'll be doing this but then pandemic came right now the environment changed the behavior changed of course i'm not saying that it's a it's a great thing or it's a bad thing i'm not saying that what i'm saying is that how did we all adapt we all adapted because the environment changed right and the environment change was external to us it was a pandemic that happened to us right but the learning and development team the human resource team they have to be a little proactive in this stage where they say that okay we need, we need to try out changing xyz environment to see what impact it has on the way right yes. because you, you can't be waiting for for things to happen you have to move so so of course now the marketers who come to come to me are the marketers who are in a soup right because they are not able to meet their targets <laughs> right which is why they have tried everything and it's not working and they want to therefore they've come across behavioral science they've come across andwani and then because i have case studies to show they're saying okay come on let's try it because everything is even though behavioral science really is not new it's it's so richard thaler won a nobel prize after 50 years of his work in 2017 so definitely it's not new right but yet to a lot of the corporate world it is new Uh, hmm. and it is novel anything new and novel brings fear right in fear you either fight or you fly yeah <laughs> so there's flight or fight right so in this case what the teams need to do is they neither need to take a flight and shy away from behavioral science nor do they need to fight their senior management about behavioral science they need to take the middle path and say that there are one two three not more than three challenges that we want to work in a year right i have a rule of 3 generally in my head because we we usually humans have a very very bad memory yet we think we have great memories uh, so we i restrict things to 3 i have three things in my work i have three things i do uh, in lot of things in life i have a rule of 3 so you you take three challenges in your year right start with one challenge right and try doing pilots try and see if you can measure the difference right not every time you'll be able to measure but the attempt should be try and measure in whatever possible way right so that we can measure a before and after and we can also try and try and separate correlation from causation now these are all technical things scientific things i'm not expecting every team every organization to do it but this should be the attempt and the attempt is try piloting one one project at least in your in your organization uh, right uh, get permission get a budget of doing one thing start with one i started with reading with one book and one behavioral science book and yeah, one project <laughs> <laughs> it has to start with one right otherwise <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah very interesting anand and i think in the interest of time we're going to take up a few of the questions on chat uh, shubham we have time till 1 pm or do we have a few minutes extra Uh, so we have time till one fifteen. So we can take the questions by one ten, and towards five minutes, uh, in the end, we'll take the feedback. Got, it. got. It. So just to quickly go back to a few of the questions in chat because they're related to the conversation. I think one of them is about organizational change, right? Because in many places, yeah. um, for whatever reason, they might be stakeholders or organizations by in nature by large itself might be very resistant to change. So yes. in in such cases, uh, how typically would a behavioral scientist approach those challenges? You know, where there, you find a lot of resistance to change, and one of your briefs would be to bring about change management itself. But I remember that's a topic that you speak about as well. Yeah, yeah. See, change absolutely bang on. Change is hard. Change is people are resistant to change, uh, and it's all natural. It's it's our inbuilt evolutionary forces working on us, right? Our our, our three things we focus on is. food sex and survival uh, right that really comprises a large part of our subconscious decision making so uh, change in our organization uh, nobody wants even the senior management uh, many a times don't want of course the senior management needs to want the change to start with otherwise there is no change that is that is going to happen right so there needs to be a uh, some sort of initiation or buy in of the senior management regarding a particular aspect or whether it's working from from you know uh, from the bottom level to up uh, if it's the bottom level to up then it's all about persuasion 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 there is there is nothing but being able to persuade your boss who can persuade their boss who can persuade their boss 
uh, there is no getting around with it because you cannot force anyone to do anything right so persuasion and behavioral science is all about persuasion how can we use behavioral science even to persuade our seniors is behavioral science right because ultimately when i am applying behavioral science for marketers to get consumers to buy the same way we will apply behavioral science for a middle management lnd or human resource person to get their senior to buy we will use behavioral science techniques and principles on them <laughs> to get a behavior, think, uh, to to get their feedback and and get yeah. the project going yeah i remember i think even you spoke about calvini's principles earlier and i think his second book after influence was on something similar i think title persuasion if i remember persuasion yes uh, yes persuasion. absolutely yeah. so there are a lot of there's a lot of priming there's a lot of nudging that can be done uh, to yeah. people uh, right mm-hmm. see essentially uh, i mean human beings on a on a level are same everywhere right and that is that a lot of us are risk averse especially people mm-hmm. who are doing jobs are more risk averse right and and understandably so because uh, employees are getting salary whether junior level middle level senior level whatever level right and as you go senior there are more you know you have more stakes so more to lose and generally as people we are loss averse loss averse in, means we hate losing more than we love winning so a senior person hates losing more than he loves or she loves winning right so therefore they are more resistant to change than a junior middle yeah we have to work with that we have to work with that psychology and loss aversion is with everyone so for example rakesh now we toss a coin right uh, heads if it comes heads um, right so either it could comes heads or tails if it comes heads um, the bet is you have to pay me 10 lakhs rupees if it comes tails i will pay you 12 lakhs would you like to take the bet yeah i i think i would probably want to avoid a loss right avoid avoid everybody most yeah. of the audience most of the people most of the uh, uh, research done across countries has proven that yeah. we are much more loss averse the the uptake the payoff has to be much higher at least twice yeah. the gain has to be there for you to you know yeah. uh, want to avoid the loss so that applies everywhere in life to our yeah. relationships to money to work as well and within mm-hmm. work like i said to senior management so the so the, the the challenge has to be of course there has to be some open mindedness to behavioral science number one that is foremost uh, right there has got to be some uh, you know understanding of how behavioral science can work for you which of course i can bring in on board uh, and show some past examples and results uh, that that i have proven and just it just so happens that 100% of my projects have been successful not because of me because of behavioral science and i keep telling clients that you know no matter which category no matter which industry i work with i am not a industry expert i am an expert in users i see consumers as users i see uh, myself as a user and personal habit i see employees as users and if that focus is there putting users first and applying uh, really powerful behavioral science principles the result is bound to bound to be good and on top of that i i try multiple solutions for the same problem so the approach becomes uh, high safety low risk and that's really what people want right the senior management wants what they want high safety low risk right and that's what behavioral science provides otherwise if you are just doing something based on your gut you are doing high risk low safety and you are doing mm. gut one solution which is our instinct a human instinct in any team is to arrive at some solution by brainstorming with our team and peers and seniors and then go ahead with that one solution right mm. that is actually very high risk of making decisions which largely everybody follows whereas behavioral science is about reducing your risk and increasing your chance of success by trying different things by trying different things actually we are reducing our risk people in their heads think that by experimenting you are increasing risk that's not true by experimenting you are reducing your risk and you are increasing your chance mm-hmm. of success very that has to be expl- that has to be once a aha moment happens in the senior management project will happen project if i were a ceo right of a large organization i would i would experiment more not less because the mm-hmm. more i experiment the more the chances of my success just like a vc the more number of startups the vc puts money in the more likely that few of them will hit it big and majority mm-hmm. will fail doesn't matter same in work also the more you experiment right the more your chances of success the lesser risk you take 
people think experimentation means risk that's wrong mm. interesting way to look at it and i think brings me to an area which i know you also work in i was having a conversation coincidentally with a friend from the venture capital world and he spoke about uh, real estate being a very favored place of investment in india although returns technically are much lower than many of the other instruments because people associate yeah. the risk with real estate to be much lesser than say a another instrument which could actually give you more so have you used this in investment as well i remember you mentioning it sometime in one of the conversations yeah yeah absolutely absolutely i firstly i manage my and my family's uh, portfolio right mm-hmm. and uh, in that you know i actually came into investing which is largely stock investing which is i see mm-hmm. it as investing in businesses i don't see it as stocks i see it as investing in businesses so uh, i've been doing it for 8 years and i came into investing in stocks because of behavioral science so i came into this field of investing uh, because of all the errors and biases and uh, you know uh, emotions that get in our way of investing rationally mm. so actually i didn't know how to value companies i didn't know valuation i didn't know business metrics in return on invested capital return on equity i didn't know all of that till some time i got into that because of behavioral science and because i know okay you know uh, i would i mean reasonably i would say half of investing is understanding valuations and growth and quality and all of that and metrics and and potential and the other half is managing your own behavior you know, some people say 90% is managing your own behavior right <laughs> so it depends morgan hausel had something right on the psychology of money correct 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 so there are lots of these behavioral science uh, understanding and uh, and principles that have actually helped me make better investing decisions and not react not have a action bias or necessarily have to do something you know so mm-hmm. largely a lot of people think that oh i will trade and i'll make money but again behavioral science studies have found 98% of the world's traders don't make money don't make over yeah. a period of 3 5 7 years but yet people mm-hmm. have a counterintuitive understanding that if i trade i will make more money because people mm-hmm. feel that doing action will make them money whereas actually in investing you invest in a good quality company with high potential and don't do anything being inactive is 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 a great deal but it's very difficult to be inactive in investing okay. yeah and uh, that's true right because i think sometimes you feel oh, we're not doing anything you know and then yeah. it kind of brings it advice great thank you anand i think it is around 1 uh, o'clock so i'm just going to look at the chat to see if there is something interesting we can pick up from there uh, shubham would you know how many we can take up today could we take up a few of them uh, maybe another two or max three your max three right so i think some of them we briefly covered during our conversations um i think there is something on early wins i think we spoke about that culture we've spoken about uh yeah i think there's a question on are there instances worldwide of learning and development stakeholders using behavioral science in driving different learning programs i think that's from arun do you want to just quickly touch on that yeah i uh you know with learning and development my uh, interaction has been focused on doing talks uh, to be honest introducing behavioral sure. science getting getting to people to see how it's getting applied and the learning app so i have yeah. not been too um involved with with lnd uh, work actual work mm. other than the learning mm. learning app uh, but sure. uh, google's rework is is a major platform rework right mm. rework is is a is a wonderful platform that you know, that uses a lot of behavioral science uh, laszlo block was was one of the people operations head at google who was in charge of uh, behavioral mm-hmm. science and uh, they they try to implement a lot of things to do with managers team building productivity collaboration yeah. so there's a lot, lot of material to be found there for sure right yeah, project and, aristotle uh, and oxygen if i remember there were two yes, projects which yes. were very successful right yeah yes yes and really it is it is really about you know and this is just we've touched upon we've just scratched upon behavioral science in this of interview right uh, when when if i start talking to lnd people and the challenge that they face uh, you know there will be multiple challenges to which behavioral science can be applied because ultimately we all humans right the employees are humans and behavioral science is going to be applicable so i have no mm-hmm. doubt in my mind it's just that i have not interacted as much other than just doing talks you know at you know, commission talks at different uh, different companies but i would love to because i feel like i mean i empathize with uh, to be honest with learning development teams and human resources because i feel it's like a very underrated uh, very very underrated uh, work profile 
yeah and there's massive things that can be done uh, in, in that area and then because if, if we are going into an age of machine learning and artificial intelligence um, then when a lot of the uh, work that can be automated uh, the real work is to manage people machines are yeah. not going to be able to manage people and grow people yeah that's never yeah. going to happen right so i feel the importance of lnd and human resources is very 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 high and it's about time that uh, those departments start using behavioral science in their actual work day to day projects makes sense and one related question anand is what are the kind of topics for which which are related to behavioral science where uh, many of our uh, attendees today who are with the uh, learning on hr organizations uh, be able to invite you for talks right so while behavioral science is a very vast subject so what are some of the yes. areas where you typically give talks on yeah so in the past i have done talks on uh, sales and marketing right because uh, that is a very very uh, large impact area organizational change which includes everything from employee motivation to productivity to uh, team collaboration team building all of those what does behavioral science finding have to say how to build psychological safety these are this is that second topic so first was sales and marketing second is organizational so behavioral science at work third is uh, behavioral science for investing right that's very dear to me i practice it uh, it's very difficult to practice uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, that is one one very big focus area uh, i have done a lot of experiments in public behavior change so those are topics but i i have done a lot of topics on personal habit change also because okay, that leads to a lot of productivity uh, you know especially yeah, in the yeah. pandemic it was very very important and now also is important because now a lot of organizations are using a hybrid model not necessarily a full time uh, at work model you know so that itself sure. is a challenge these are the interesting yeah. wonderful thank you anand let me just take up a couple more questions before we wrap up um, i think there is one which is about self awareness where uh, prateet has commented that not much importance is given today to self awareness this mostly derails one's growth and or organization's growth along the way do you think being self aware and enabling change is synonymously profitable to the org or yeah of course of course about? the more self aware individuals that the organization has uh, the consciousness of that organization also goes up though mm -hmm. this is nothing to do with behavioral science it's to do with very personalized uh, different techniques which i'm sure a lot of you all would have heard of breath work uh, you know meditation these are all uh, very different techniques to increase self awareness and self awareness has to do a lot with consciousness whereas behavioral science has, has a lot to do with subconscious decision making so they are mm -hmm. uh, they are complementary i would say uh, behavioral science is not really something that uh, i have used to increase my self awareness actually i have used to get around my self awareness by reducing the size of the plate or putting a something you know a pull up bar but on the pull up bar i have painted yellow and black like minet work so that my eye goes to it and i do pull ups so so it's different i would say self awareness is very personal very uh, uh personal self directed uh, uh kind of activities where you're trying to increase the thoughts that are coming in your mind and you're trying to be aware of who you are what you want what problems you face it's very different i would say Uh, I would say it's not part of behavioral science uh, toolkit. Yeah, sure. And I think one question which I think we briefly touched upon, I think we spoke about psychological safety as well. That in organizations, people are resistant to change for many reasons, and one could be the absence of psychological safety, right? And I think yeah, Google and yeah. WeWork also did some work on that. So that fear is actually stopping people from being adaptable to change. So does behavioral science have a role to play in? that yeah absolutely it has uh, the the lens that behavioral science will look at at building psychological safety is not just look at the outcome and and the absolute response of whether people are able to speak in a meeting whereas behavioral science will look at the underlying systems and processes in the company what am i being promoted for how am i being promoted what are the things you are uh, you know tapping you know giving me a pat on my shoulder for what are the things that you are punishing me for right these are the things that as as a project behavioral science will evaluate and then implement nudges and interventions that will result in psychological safety because psychological safety is outcome it's not a part of toolkit it's an outcome it is what we desire uh, but the changes we will we will be doing is on the systems and processes of the company which will bring about uh, and, there, and again in that there are many things that one can do yes. 
to bring about cycle uh sure one interesting question from justlene uh which is your idea is a very intriguing anand and it will be great to know your favorite books to read for beginners on this topic yeah for beginners please pick up uh, my favorite richard thaler's a nudge Nudge. yeah uh, it made me quit my job start be on my own <laughs> so it had that much of an impact i am not trying to say that you <laughs> can make you do that but uh, but it's a great book it's it's very easy to read so imagine it's a nobel prize winner who's a academician but has uh, come up with a book that's for lay you know for lay people uh, sure. that's like simplicity is the ultimate sophistication so richard thaler is, is my ultimate there are many people uh, right uh if one book i have to suggest is that there is another very popular book which a lot of people attempt to read thinking fast and slow but it is also found in studies that very few people finish reading thinking fast and slow. <laughs> so it is on the other end of the uh, spectrum daniel kahneman also is a nobel prize winner uh, both have their strengths and uh, ad, you know advantages uh, but uh, there's richard thaler there's robert cialdini Uh, influence it was written many many years back it is absolutely valid even as of date and i feel it will be valid uh, for the next many many decades as well it's so powerful uh, again there are thousands so i think these are names uh, two three names wonderful wonderful i think i'll take a wonderful recommendations also thank you anand i just take up maybe one more uh probably this would be the last one how do we reduce the gap between intent and action interesting one related to your field yeah that is the that was the summation of the entire talk <laughs> that is the that is the summation of behavioral science that is the attempt reducing gap between intention and action my intent like i said is to work out so therefore i have put a pull up rod in my house but to convert into action i also painted it yellow and black just like you know you see road safety signs on the road uh, where men are at work so that my eye goes on to it and that converts my action into intention into into action and uh, if you go to my instagram profile you will see hundreds of such nudges uh, which are all about examples of changing intention to action so Wonderful. behavioral underscore design is my hashtag is my handle on instagram you'll find a lot of examples on that how to you know how in whether it's diet fitness uh, work yeah. money how do you get you know moving from intention to action so that if behavioral science was a company i think reducing the gap between intent and action seems like a nice tagline absolutely that is a tagline <laughs> very nice thank you so much anand and i think we have we're just about uh, over on time uh, once again for people who joined us today do uh, uh, feel free to share any of your learnings from today on social media you can use uh, either the focus you id to tag us the handle uh, or focus you five starter as a hashtag and please tag anand as well thank you once again for joining thank us you. we hope to kind of continue this uh, going ahead and i think uh, considering some of the topics that are there i think we've put a short a uh, feedback link here it will really help us to plan for the future uh, in ensuring that we we'll bring you topics that are relevant for the audience and hopefully will help us all in this journey to be able to learn from each other and grow as professionals but uh, thank you so much and please do click on the link and give us your feedback and uh, justlin has a question on your instagram id again anand could you just put it on chat so that just in case people have missed it are you able uh, to yeah let me see right, because right. i'm on the phone i'm going to do it yeah i'm going to do it ah okay okay just ignore my look right now since i'm typing on the <laughs> no um, worries but uh, in the meantime i think it's so... this i think it's this i hope it's this <laughs> <laughs> all right so please feel free to uh, connect with us on any of our social handles thank you so much uh pleasure i think the time just flew like somebody uh, put a question i think like anand said it is just the start of a conversation it's too huge a topic to be able to cover in a short one hour chat like this appreciate the time that you took out anand for this and really hope to thank see you, you again soon thank, thank you, you so rakesh much. thank Thanks you everyone. shivam and thank you everyone who joined uh, i hope everyone's answers you know in the chat were sort of covered if not yeah. we'll speak we'll thank speak you so again. much and uh, we are possibly we're going to be sending out a few winners things i think we didn't get time to announce that so probably shubham we can do that maybe over email i think people have logged off as well yeah
Sure, sure. Thanks, everyone. Have a great, great day. Here.